We have had a lot of RVs over the years. 14 years on the road and experience in 12 different RVs. Of all different styles, and we're going to share what we liked about them and what we didn't. on the path that I've chosen straight up. Come on. Over the many years on the road, and even before we officially hit the road full time, we've had experience with a lot of different RVs, and I was really surprised when I tallied them all up that we have lived in and traveled in 12 different ones. So we've basically covered the, the ABCs the, um, and the Ds, there's no Ds, no but D's. we've done trailer behinds and just about every type of RV we've got experience at least sleeping in, other than truck campers and those over overlanding adventure vehicle types. So we thought it might be fun and maybe even interesting for you if we went down the different styles of RVs that we've traveled in and kind of share some of the pros and cons of each and how they apply for extended travel or full timing. And I thought uh, I'll start with towables. Towables, the things that you pull behind a vehicle, a yep. Jeep, a truck, uh, whatever. Right. So there's several different types of towables. There's pop-up campers, there's the bumper pull style where there's an enclosed camper shell, <laughs> and then there's fifth wheels, which... Um, Toes from a kingpin coming up at the back of a truck. So a lot of things that you can tow. And, and uh, so we'll start with pop-ups. So these are also called folding tent camper trailers, and basically they're compact, and then you crank them up, and they become a folding tent. Yeah, they're like origami. It's um, yeah, a combination of hard walls and soft walls and stuff. And I got, actually kind of grew up with a pop-up camper. When we was growing up, we lived down at the, we'd take our pop-up camper out to the New Jersey Pine Barrens and Jersey Shore and did a big family trip to Florida. And it was great for that sort of uh, uh, family trips, pile the kids in one side, parents in the other, a lot of space, fairly affordable. And I also had a pop-up camper before I met Chris. I'd actually purchased it to kind of use as a hurricane evacuation second home. <laughs> and because uh, I lived in Florida and we had hurricanes pummel us back in 2004. Well, almost a lot of years too. But I thought it would be a good idea to have that available just in case my house got damaged and I needed a temporary housing. Never happened, never needed it for that purpose, but that got me out into Florida State Park Systems and introduced to recreational camping. So in many ways... Our prior experiences has kind of led yeah. partly to us hitting the road and meeting each <laughs> yeah, other. Those, those were, were both kind of our first RVing experiences were pop-ups in that sense. But, you know, what is a pop-up good for and not good for? Oh. So they are fantastic for uh, people who have limited storage ability, don't have a large vehicle to pull a, a pop-up camper because they're relatively lightweight. Low wind resistance because when they're popped down, they're low Low clearance. So they're great for recreational camping, RVing, but <laughs> recreational vehicle. It is totally for that purpose. It's great for families. I used to take it to festivals with a bunch of friends and we would just use it as a base camp. Um, but it, I don't think it's really that great for full timing or extended travel. No, because there's so much setup time doing the popping part of the pop-up and then the popping down. And particularly, it's one of the most unpleasant things you could do is having to put a pop-up up, up in the rain or worse, down in the rain, and then you have to pop it up again and dry it out when you get home and the weather's better. So there's so much setup and extra hassle with pop-ups. And then you've got no insulation. It's just a thin, basically a tent. Can so as well. our, our take on it, keep pop-ups for recreational use. Don't consider them if you're doing extended travel or full time. Bumper pull trailers. So these are going to be enclosed trailers, no popping up, <laughs> no minimal setup. You basically are probably going to need a little bit heavier of a vehicle to pull them. So a truck, an SUV, a Jeep. Uh, we have had experience with three different ones. The first one that Chris hit the road in solo was a tab teardrop style. Right. So when I decided to set off and become a tech nomad, I wanted the smallest, lightest, simplest trailer I could find. Um, I initially set out looking for something I could tow with a Prius, realized that was basically nothing, so I got a Jeep Liberty and a tiny tab clamshell that um, 
was it was particularly being a small trailer like that it was so convenient that you could actually move it around by hand so i can position for the ideal camp spot and the view of the river and stuff like that um and small simple trailers like that are actually really fabulous and kind of had so many advantages over a pop-up because you just walk back the doors open all your stuff set up no setup time required it was very convenient and then uh, we did full time in that after he hit the road solo. I met him during the course of that, joined him on the road. We did seven months in that. And discovered uh, the downsides of small trailers. <laughs> that one did not have a bathroom, an air conditioner, or any other conveniences. It had solar and mobile internet, so like, what else do you need? Uh, but that did become an issue long term for a couple. And I think for full timing, that was probably not the ideal trailer. But Too we, small and simple. But we made it work for over a year, basically, mm -hmm. including Chris's travel time. Uh, so we did upgrade to a fiberglass trailer. This was slightly larger, had all of the amenities of a full RV with a kitchen and bathroom and air conditioning. Yeah, this was an Oliver um, Legacy Elite, a 17 foot uh, egg, basically, that you could tow. Mm -hmm. Still and there's, a, there's other versions out there, yeah. like the Casita and the Scamp, which mm -hmm. this was based on, just kind of made to a higher end caliber. And the, the nice thing about these kind of small, it kind of was a sweet spot. It still had absolutely all the amenities, but still was pullable by a small vehicle. And we pulled it by a Jeep. Um, which is, and, you know, that's a kind of a sweet spot size for towable trailers. And then you get bigger and you need a bigger tow vehicle all of a sudden, which changes all your lifestyle and manu maneuverability. Absolutely. So those two smaller ones we pulled with a 4x4 Jeep Liberty. And the Oliver was actually on a raised axle. So we would do a lot of off-roading with it mm -hmm. and take it to places that we can't with other types of RVs. So that was great, a great benefit of that. But once we did actually get a uh, Toyota Tundra eventually to tow the Oliver and that turning radius and the extended length really changed the way in which we would travel and we kind of lost a lot of our ability to do some of the more remote and, and we lost the ability to enjoyably go into tight little cities too. So that's kind mm -hmm. of the trade-off is you go to bigger trailers, you need bigger trucks, which means that's your bigger everyday vehicle. So that's a downside if you want to full-time mm -hmm. in a bumper pull trailer. Right. Uh, we did have also experience staying in an Airstream. We never owned one. We never traveled with one. Uh, but when we were hunting for our bus conversion, which we'll talk about later, uh, we did stay with some friends who had a, an Airstream on the side of the yard. And so we had the experience of living inside of one. It was larger than our Oliver was, mm -hmm. allowed us to spread out more, uh, had a separate uh, bedroom from the living area and kitchen. So that was really cool. We did consider an Airstream when we were looking at uh, going to the Oliver and just decided we didn't want the larger tow vehicle to have to pull it. Right, right, absolutely. Now, but the, uh, the advantages of uh, towable trailers of... All right, so the advantage of snowball trailers is, is they're already set up. The, the, um, you've got, you know, uh, can tow it with a lot, wide range of vehicles. You don't necessarily need a truck. You can have a big SUV and stuff like that. Because, like, fifth wheels, you need, a, you know, a truck bed to tow a fifth wheel. So a bumper pull is more flexible in what you can tow it with. Um, kind of the downside of that is it also is a little bit harder to tow, more prone to swaying and stuff like that than a fifth wheel, which is very, very easy to tow. And we actually did. Uh, jackknife towing the tab and ended up doing a 360 down the interstate in it. So, yes, so definitely yeah. keep that in mind with the safety issues with a bumper pull. Uh, but it is great to be able to leave your house behind at the campground or wherever you're setting up and still have a reasonable vehicle for going out exploring in. And then getting back home and your home's already set up and you can just yeah. walk right in. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, so would we go back to a towable trailer? Personally, it's not so the the maybe for a, a vacation time in a small one, a tab scale or Oliver mm -hmm. scale, with a small tow vehicle, but a bigger bumper pull, I don't just don't see. No, that's a reason we went to other styles of RVs and boats is we just didn't want that larger truck. Um, so that's what <laughs> had us switch over to motorhomes. But before we go to motorhomes, let's uh, talk about the other type of towable, and that is the fifth wheel. And these have like a gooseneck, and they attach to the center point of a, of a truck, so they're a lot safer to pull. Uh, you don't have those sway issues as yeah, much. And, and you can carry a lot more capacity with that. You, so the fifth wheels can get absolutely, ginormously huge, particularly if they start putting in 
tons and tons of slide outs and you basically have an apartment that you're towing around a small suburban house even right and we did get to uh, borrow one uh when we were doing a bus renovation and it was running behind schedule one of our kind blog readers loaned us theirs <laughs> uh brought it to the rv shop that we were at and we got to live on site in it so we got to experience a few weeks of living in one we've never traveled with one yeah. and yeah we, we know lots of people who We've been in lots of fifth wheels, and they are really nice, particularly if you're going places and you're going to be set up for a while. And so we actually, some people don't even have bother owning a truck. They'll just hire a service to move their fifth wheel between two, two or three different seasonal spots. Um, and you get a lot of space, a lot of living space for your money with a fifth wheel. Um, and a living space that feels more like a traditional home. Yeah. So a lot of the fifth wheels that are out there, they are decorated and appointed with recliners and fireplaces fake... and ceiling fans. Uh, so if you're looking for a mobile home, a mobile house, uh, a fifth wheel is a great way to go. Uh, great if you're going to be still for a while yeah. in places, maybe doing contract work or needing to live nearby in a certain location. I think if you were traveling a lot and moving locations a lot, I, a lot of our friends who started out that way, they ended up moving to other styles just because the setup and takedown did get a little annoying for them. And also the requirement that you'd have this big honking truck all the time too, that becomes your daily driver. So that switches us around to motorhomes. So instead of, uh, of, of pulling your house, you drive your house and maybe pull behind a smaller, more practical daily driver vehicle potentially. So. And yeah, so we switched over to motorhomes um, after our trailer days. We did four years total on the road in towable trailers. And uh, for the reason that we just didn't want that large uh, truck. And uh, <laughs> we just were ready for a different style. So yes. there are three different classes of motorhomes, A, B, and C. We're going to start with C and work our way backwards. Up to the A's, yeah. <laughs> so, the, so C's are built on top of, they're basically is the... Uh, Manufacturer starts with a truck chassis and then basically takes the cab and then builds some sort of thing on the back. And they can be relatively small to actually relatively huge super C's. Um, traditional class C's have a bed over the cab. Some of them just make that extra storage space or just, you know, entertainment space. Um, and they have their... They're interesting designs. It's kind of a classic motorhome style. And they're typically under 30 feet. So if you're looking for a smaller motorhome, but not so small that you're in a van, uh, that's a great way to go. Now, Chris, had uh, you rented one as a kid. Well, yep. you didn't rent it as a kid. Your family <laughs> rented it. Yeah, so my, my first big RVing experience other than the pop-up was a, a trip through New Zealand where we had a rental Class C for a week or two. And it was amazing. And it's perfect for that sort of adventure where... Um, it's small enough and it's already set up that you don't have a lot of, of teardown set up. You can go places and explore. It's great for that kind of, of vacationing. Um, I've had we, an absolutely magical experience with that. Made yeah. a great first impression of RVing. And then uh, when our bus was <laughs> being in the shop, uh, we rented a Class C up in Alaska for a week and traveled around the Kenai Peninsula. It was a small 22-footer, just the two of us, um, and it was great to be able to be in a self-contained vehicle that we drove, we slept in, we did our cooking in, we could park it in uh, reasonable parking lots on the way to go grocery shopping and tourist things that we were doing. So it was a great experience, and I think it planted seeds in our mind when we were ready for a, a van yeah. later that, oh, the self-contained small is great. Yeah, the, the, some of the, the downsides of, of Class C's is... Um, a lot of them, you're kind of pushing weight limits and vehicle limits and stuff there. They're not necessarily going to be well suited for towing another vehicle. So some Class Cs really are pushing it to tow something else behind them. But some are, are some capable are, Some of are it. Very, very capable of it. So you've got to really, uh, Class Cs are a lot of trade-offs and balance. Not, not all Class Cs are created equal. But they also tend to be more on the affordable side right. when you're comparing them to, say, a Class A motorhome that is purpose-built to be a drivable RV. Right. Um, so you can find some really affordable ones there. Tend, tend to be more on the recreational side of qu uh, build quality as opposed to extended travel full-time living. Yes. But that's not always true. There are some great brands yeah. out there. And like uh, we, when we were out hunting, there was a couple brands that were on our short list. It's like, that could, that, we could see that working for us. So mm -hmm. Class C, would you live in a Class C again? Absolutely. I think I would do extended travel in the Class C if it suited our travel yeah. style at the mm -hmm. time. It doesn't right now. It's yeah. not a fit in our current fleet. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so that, I guess, switches us the two to a we're van. We're going to be, which are uh, motorhomes that are built on a van chassis. And yeah, so there's either the, the, the bees that are basically, they take a van chassis and, the, and everything external is pretty much stock, and then they just convert the inside. Or there's B pluses where they kind of extend and you know build out from a van chassis and it might be wider and taller than a stock van. And we have experience with both. So before we started hunting for our bus conversion, <laughs> we borrowed a class B from a friend. Uh, for about, it was about five or six weeks, I think we lived in it and did some traveling yeah. around the East Coast as we shopped for buses. And yeah, the, the advantage of a B, a B is because their they're van size is that you can basically take them almost anywhere. They're smaller than, than C's, they they're, can get into most parking lots and don't go through drive throughs though. They're usually You'll a little bit too tall, tall for that. that. Yep. But yeah, they're, they're so flexible like that. So this was great for having a, a vehicle to tour around the country and do our Bus shopping. This was a Winnebago Lasharo, which we had quite a few adventures with. Uh, the Lasharo was the predecessor to the Winnebago Rialta, which is the more popular one. Uh, also not made anymore, but it was a great little layout. Uh, it was about 19 feet, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 19, 20. Would fit. Maybe, yeah. So it, it we could park it in most parking lots fairly reliably. We were, and it was very nimble. Uh, this one particular was. Um, had some interesting stories. Go we, check the blog. We've got a, some <laughs> a very amusing stories of adventures in the Lasharo. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. It set us up for dealing with issues on the road. Uh, there's that positive. Uh, but then later, um, now we, we're on our boat right now. We actually split our time between our boat and our Class A bus conversion. And we use a van now, which we added to our fleet about a year ago, to get between the two and use as a daily driver. So we've actually now spent some extended time uh, staying in our Winnebago Travado, which is uh, 19 feet long. Yeah, and so the purpose, we sought out the Travado and got lots of other videos about why we picked this Travado and stuff, is is it is going to be the vehicle that we use to teleport between our um, boat on the East Coast and our uh, bus on the West Coast in Arizona and such. And something, something that is easy to travel cross country in, but is also then easy to park in marina parking lots or be a get around everyday vehicle. So we needed something that would fit in regular parking spots and be relatively simple, unobtrusive, not too mm. RV-ish, <laughs> yes. But we love it. Yes. Uh, we ended up three months in it last fall on our, we made an extended trip <laughs> across country due to the weather and hurricane evacuations and things like that. We ended up three months in it, it was incredibly comfortable comfortable, much more comfortable than we thought it would be. Yeah. And it made a really great trip back this spring. And we're using it as a daily driver now that we are fairly stationary in the boat uh, going through the pandemic. So uh, yeah, the Class B has a lot of great benefits of having that all-in-one-ness, the mm -hmm. nimbleness. Um, yeah, the, 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 the size is great for shorter term. It'd be tough to live full time in something as small as a Class B. But people do it. People do it. We certainly lived in something even smaller back in our tab days. Um, the, there's a definite lack of storage for a lot of other things. If you want to bring along toys and gear and all sorts of other stuff, Class Bs have a lot of compromises. So, you know, all RVs have a lot of compromises. Mm -hmm. Can't Class Bs are optimized to one end of that extreme. So, um, they small, definitely serve their purpose. Small holding tanks, so you're going to be dumping <laughs> oh, and yes. filling very often. They also are pretty pricey for the size vehicle that you get, the size of um, the amount of living space that you get. And a lot of that is because there's a lot of labor that goes into building something in an existing shell. And small. Mm -hmm. yeah. And But people do have do-it-yourself versions as well if you want to do it on yeah. a more affordable scale. Uh, but overall, I, we are doing extended travel in our Class B, and we love it. So, yeah, Absolutely. I would, and I think if we were setting out for an extended trip or um, something like that, we would choose a Class B over many other options. Yeah, just, just that you gain such a huge advantage being able to go into normal parking spots and navigate in places like that. And that's actually, there's some, some Class Bs that are on extended vans that get up to be about 24, 25 feet long. You give that up in some of those cases because you no longer do fit in that, in that. Mm -hmm. you're trading still a very narrow vehicle, but now you've got a... a just extra length. All right. Now moving on to the Class A's. Class A's. These are motor, the true motorhome. When you think of a motorhome, the more bus style. Uh -huh. um, these are usually built on a truck or a, a, a custom chassis, a, like right. a Freightliner or, or something, a chassis that they just start with a chassis and build up. So 
they're kind of blank slates. They can be almost anything on top of these chassis. Um, so we had the opportunity, uh, again, when our bus conversion was in the shop and fifth wheel owners needed theirs back, the shop was able to get us a loner class A to live on, on site. Uh, it was a Georgetown, I think it was about 34 feet. We actually did a YouTube video yeah. on it at the time with our first impressions of it, of living in it. We stayed in that for a couple of weeks. Um, that one was uh, priced around 150, I think, if I remember correctly, which is about what we have into our bus conversion overall. Uh, so it was more on the uh, moderate scale, yeah. I think, as far as construction build, and it was okay for that purpose. I would not go buy one myself. I wouldn't. The, the, there's yeah, the class A's range so much in quality mm -hmm. from things that you know, are basically built to be used a couple weekends a year to things that are built to be lived in and. The, the, the durability, the quality of construction rain differs so much across that spectrum. Um, and a lot of the, the more basic Class A's are pretty flimsy. Um, <laughs> so to get a quality one, you are bumping up into six figures, at least new. Well, yeah. But mm -hmm. if you go and get really old ones that were built to, that were, yeah. were those, the like, super high end ones, the super the high end ones, they usually have held up really well over the years, and you can get some great deals on those, which is what led us to going to a vintage bus conversion. Now, we went a little older than what <laughs> she might want to do. Yeah, so we started thinking, because the advantages of a Class A is that you get a lot of living space, you get a lot of general power. They generally ride much better down the road. They have more advanced suspensions than a Class C because they're designed to be this big sort of thing. They can tow vehicles behind them and stuff. So they're great motor homes. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> we when we were looking for going to a motorhome, uh, we were looking for to spend about fifty grand was about our right. price cap for acquisition, knowing that we we're going to put a lot more money into making it right. ours over time. Uh, when we started looking in that price range at motorhomes, traditional ones, there wasn't a lot that, that was, impressed us. Yeah, they were either low quality or just too generic feeling for us. And that's what led us to looking for, at bus conversions. And bus conversions are taking a, a highway bus, like an over-the-road uh, Greyhound-style bus, and building using that to build a motorhome out of. Yeah, so a, a bus conversion is starting actually with a full-on bus shell that is made for you know, commercial service, so they're they're designed and engineered to be, you know, million mile vehicles that are in commercial service, you know, running twelve hours a day. So they're overbuilt for um R V usage, which is really great if you want a foundation of something to live in full time. Now we wanted something on the smaller side because uh buses are because they are revenue generating vehicles. Uh, they're gonna be to the max highway standard yes. so they can fit as many people in there as possible to that each ticket is money. Uh, so we went back to a vintage uh, 1961, 4106 is what we ended up with uh, because at that time, the max highway length was 35 feet and a lot of the older parks that we like were built to those standards because yes. that was the max length that things were. Now, a lot of modern bus conversions are now at 45 feet because that's the, the more recent bus length limits, which means you then have a tag axle, a whole second axle in the back, and but you know, you know drives like a bus, which is actually mm -hmm. drives nice. <laughs> yes. So we have had our bus conversion since 2011. We full-timed in that up to 2017 when we bought our boat, uh, which is a whole other topic. We have a whole bunch of videos on that as well. Um, and we love our bus. We still have it. We uh, intend to continue to split our year up between the boat and the bus and the van. Uh, never seems like there's enough months in the year to do it all. But yeah. uh, we love our bus. Yeah. Absolutely love it. And yeah. totally would full time in it because we did. Yeah. And the <laughs> advantage of bus conversions is, and, and the disadvantage simultaneously, is that they are all, pretty much all completely custom for better or for worse. So you end up being able to reflect your personality if you're buying one that's already converted. You know, you've got to then adapt somebody else's personality mm -hmm. to you. Um, and uh, But you get some really interesting stuff by going into the conversion world. Right. But you also are maintaining a vehicle that, meant, is, unique. that <laughs> is unique and was also meant for commercial service. And remember, being maintained by a company that has a vested interest in revenue. So they can be a little pricier to maintain than a traditional Class A, but you know, um, I, you know, I know a, we know a lot of traditional Class A owners who have some pretty hefty repair bills too. So, Absolutely. any of these moving vehicles that are under earthquake conditions all the time, eh, they're going to have repair bills that go along with them. So. so, which of all of these would you 
personally want to live in again, other than you, of course, if you're starting from a blank slate? I don't know. Right now, I'm fixated on the van the most. I, <laughs> um, I do miss the Oliver at times. I yeah. love that fiberglass trailer. Mm -hmm. We did two and a half years in it. When we sold it, it was looking brand new. Yeah, that was the advantage of a high-end fiberglass egg is they don't mm -hmm. age. It's basically just as good as the day you bought it. Um, but yeah, I, each one of these uh, RVs have served a purpose in our travel journeys and our own journey to the road and staying on the road. And you know, I love them all. There's well, maybe the the, the Lasharo. <laughs> it I served a purpose. It, it taught us. Purpose. It taught us patience and how to deal with uh, <laughs> uh, continual um, malfunctions, one on top of another. And it created a great story. <laughs> but, yeah, every, every RV is trade offs. Every RV design has got different good purposes and bad purposes. And uh, I think it's important to be flexible and allow as your life purpose change. Um, to change the the RV underneath it. Don't try to fit a round peg in a square hole. Maybe it's time to just change things up when you're ready. And yeah, I think that's the <laughs> lesson of our story. Is we're not afraid to change it up when we want to. And we have changed it up many times over the years. There is no one size fits all solution. And uh, leave yourself the agility to to change it up as you go. Don't get in over your head on you know and bills and payments to a point that because these are all depreciating mostly. Uh, <laughs> It hasn't been the case for us, but they're mostly depreciating <laughs> assets, which means, you know, when you go to sell it, you're probably not going to get what you have into it. So keep that in mind and make that a conscious part of your shopping decision. And enjoy your ABCs. We create these videos just for fun, and we love having you along for the ride. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up, leave a comment, or if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. See you next time.